And last week, we started a new sermon series entitled Favorite Verses. And this sermon series really came out of a time of reflection in my own life, uh, just verses that have meant a lot to me. Um, I don't know if you guys know or not, but I'm 55 years old this year. Um, yeah, I know you ain't got to... Some of you have pets that old, I know, but anyway. I've been married to my beautiful wife, Michelle, for 32 years. And... Um, we have two adult children, three grandchildren. I've been the pastor here at BFCOG for, this is my 18th year now. Um, I, I, also, I also have another job. I'm, I'm a, like everybody here on staff, we're, we're, we don't look at it as really bivocational as we do co-vocational because it's kind of like you do both. And so I've, I have another job that I've been at for, for 32 years. And just to even say that, it, it seemed, time just goes by so quickly. It just goes by so fast, and I've just been reflecting on some scriptures in God's Word that I've held on to during different seasons of my life, and in fact, many times these verses are what held my life together whenever it, I felt like it was just falling apart. I don't know if you guys have verses like that where you just, where there's some verses that you have that you, the Holy Spirit just recalls in your, in your mind just... It just kind of gives you hope during hopeless situations. There's, th these are verses that, that gives you uh, a strength to kind of face whatever life may throw your way. If you don't have those kind of verses, I, I pray that, that you will get some of these verses on the inside of you. Because here's what I can tell you. I said it last week. I'll say it again this week. You better know the word of God because you will go through some times in your life when you're going to need the word of God. You're going to need a word from God when you don't have a Bible. And what I mean by that is there's going to be something that, that hits you in life. There's going to be some times that the rug gets pulled out from under you where you just don't know what, what to do. But I'm telling you what, when you know God and you know his word, let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit will remind you of those scriptures in those moments. And it's in those moments, man, that, that, that you hold on to those verses, that, that you cling to those verses. So I thought it might be good just to look at some different passages of scripture that have anchored my life during different storms of my life, but also maybe they've anchored your life as well. And if you weren't able to be here last Sunday, we begin this journey with those powerful and poetic words from the prophet Isaiah, who simply said in chapter 40, those who put their hope in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up on wings as eagles. They will shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Does anybody believe that? Man, it's the truth. It is absolutely the truth. And if it's all right with everybody, I'd like to take you to another passage of Scripture that has been instrumental in my walk with Christ and has helped me, I guess, in my attempt to be a pastor here specifically. But if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Galatians. And we're going to look at the words of the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to read chapter 6, starting in verse number 7. And uh, if you've been here for any length of time at all, then you've heard me preach out of this passage of scripture probably many times, but it is a, a very familiar passage of scripture. And here's what the apostle Paul writes to his church at Galatia. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will also reap for he who sows to the flesh will all will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And here's the part that I hold on to and let us not grow weary and well doing for in due season, we shall reap if we don't lose heart. We shall reap if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, you guys do know that you have opportunity right now. That's why I said, you know, time is short. The life is quickly passing you by. You're older now than you ever thought you'd be. And guess what? You'll be older than you can imagine in a week. And it's just the way life, but you've got an opportunity right now. And he says, well, we have that opportunity. Let us do good to all people, but especially those who are of the household of faith. Would anybody say amen? amen? Today, I just want to speak to you for a few moments on this thought. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Would you all pray with me? Father, we love you. And again, Father, we thank you for an amazing and incredible time of worship. God, when we think about the power of your word, that you stepped in the middle of nothing and you spoke and everything that you spoke came to be. All because of the power of your word. 
And even in our own lives, we believe that when you speak, you can create whatever you have willed to be and it will happen. So God, we pray that you will speak here this morning to that person, Father, that is far from you. But God, they find themselves sitting in a seat in a church on Sunday morning. I pray, God, that you will speak into their life's life and let them know, Father, that that you came and that you lived and that you died, that you were buried, that you rose again for them and that they can have new life in you. I pray for that person, God, that's just drifting and they're faith and they're drifting along and they're, and they're playing some kind of a church. I pray God that you would just realign their faith. You'd reignite their faith. You would, you'd light a fire inside of them today, Father. God, whatever we need, we pray, Father, that you would just provide it and give it. And we give you all praise. We give you all glory. And it's in Christ's name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let us not grow weary and well doing for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Don't give up in doing good because at the right time you will reap if you don't quit. Dr. Tony Evans tells a story of a time when he was in college and he worked for Trailways Bus Station. And his job was to load and unload buses when they came in. He says, I worked the dead man shift from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. And when I came to work there, I realized the guys had a scam going on. A guy would punch out for lunch and then have his buddies punch him back in when in reality, he was asleep on the job. Each guy would get his turn and the other guy would cover for each other and await their turn to get three hours or so of sleep while they were supposed to be on the job. Put simply, what they were doing was stealing. They had agreed to work eight hours, but they were stealing a few hours every night from the company. After I'd been around a few days, one of the guys came to me and asked me which part of the night shift I wanted to take for a long, long break. He explained how the system worked, how long a break I could take, and who I was to punch in for. When I told him I couldn't do it because I was a Christian, what I thought would be a great witnessing opportunity didn't go over too well. And the guys all got together and decided to teach me a lesson. When the buses would show up during the night needing to be unloaded and then reloaded, the other guys wouldn't show up and help me. So I found myself loading and unloading buses all by myself. He writes, that situation was hard. It was painful, but both emotionally knowing people were against me, but also physically because it was a lot of hard work. And to top it off, after doing all that, I still had to go to class when I got off work. After six months of doing this, I got caught into the office, the trailways office. The supervisor told me and said this, unbeknownst to the night crew, we have had various night supervisors come down and observe the activities, and we are aware of the scam that is taking place. But then he said, we have also noticed that you haven't participated and have not been supported or helped when the buses come in to be unloaded and reloaded. And then the supervisor said this, we would like to offer you the opportunity to become supervisor for the night shift and we will double your salary. Can I tell you, my friends, let us not grow weary in well-doing for at the proper time you will reap if you don't give up. Now, I also need to say this. I'm sure that as Tony Evans was unloading and reloading those buses, I'm sure as he was feeling ostracized and put down and, and talked about behind his back by all of his fellow workers, I'm sure there was times that he would say to himself, is this really worth it? I'm sure when he got home from work early in the morning after he had worked and had to go through all that drama while he was in that place, and then he had to go to school and try to study and focus and try to learn what he needed to learn while he's at school, I'm sure he probably had times in his life there are times in that moment, times in that season of his life where he probably thought to himself, is it really worth it? Can I just tell you, my friends, spiritually speaking, you will have some is it worth it moments in your walk with Christ. Can I just give you the good news and the bad news of Christianity this morning? The good news is that walking with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is a journey that is filled and overflowing with God's provision, God's promises, and God's protection. In fact, if somebody were to look at your life with Christ and compare it to your life outside of Christ, even though you've had some great struggles and some challenges in life, is there anybody here that can testify that my life now with Christ is so much better than my life was without Christ? Does anybody say amen to that? We have so much to rejoice 
in and so much to rejoice over. And maybe you think, well, I don't have everything I really want in this life. Travis, I, there's some things that I'm really missing out on. Can I remind you of some things that you do have this morning, my friend? If you got daily bread to eat, if you got clothes on your backside, if you got a roof over your head, then you have a reason to rejoice. You can rejoice in the new mercies that God give you every single morning. You can rejoice in the fact that, that God in his love for you, Guess what? He did not, he did not leave you whenever you, you found yourself in a place that no Christian ever had any business being. God never gave up on you. In fact, God was with you, digging you out of that place, trying to get you back on the path that he has for you. You can rejoice in the fact of knowing that when this life comes to an end, that you got a home in heaven. You can rejoice, my friends. Please understand, you can rejoice the life that God has given to you. And that's good news this morning. Can I get an amen? amen? Now let me give you the bad news, that while walking with the Lord will bring you, I believe, great fulfillment in your life and great satisfaction in your life, it can also lead to great frustration. Because when you really commit your life to Christ, I'm not talking about you give a costless acknowledgement of Christ, I'm talking about when you really surrender God puts something on the inside of you where, where you've got to read his word and you've got to pray and, and you want to develop and grow in this relationship that's with him. But when you start reading his word, there's some commandments that you will read that, that your flesh isn't going to agree with. There's going to be some things that you read that looks good on paper, but to actually live it out, to actually put it into practice can be very frustrating. You say, give me some examples. Well, it's not always easy to pray for people who despitefully use you. It's not always easy to forgive someone who has done you wrong, not just one time, but 70 times, seven times. I don't know about you guys, but when somebody slaps me on one side of the cheek, it's hard for me just to, just to turn and offer the other side to them as well. It's not always easy to love them who hate you. It's not always easy to bite your tongue when people talk about you behind your back. It's not always easy taking the high road and trying to do the right thing when the wrong thing seems to be happening. In fact, it can lead to a, a point of frustration in your walk with the Lord. Now, I will say this. It's easy to do the right thing every now and then. It's easy to do the right thing every so often, but to consistently and willingly and daily do the right thing can be one of the most frustrating experiences in your walk with Christ. And I would say one of the biggest challenges of Christianity is to consistently take the high road. And the reason why it can be so frustrating is this, even if you failed physics in school, you still live your life by the first rule of physics, which is this, for, that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction that you say, what do you mean by that, Brother Travis? I mean by that, by when you do right to somebody, you expect right to be done to you. That when I do good, I expect good to be done to me. That when I act right, I expect the right thing to be happening to me. That when I do good to you, I expect good to be done back to me. When I forgive you, I expect you to forgive me. That, that when I stay out of your business, that means that you stay out of my business. That when I'm a peacemaker, I expect peace to be brought back to me. But can I tell you, my friend, it's hard to be a peacemaker when you're with somebody or you're around people that all they want to do is just fight all the time. It's hard to be a giver when you're surrounded by people who just selfishly always want to take all the time. It's hard always to give your best that you have when you never get acknowledged for all the hard work you put in. It's hard to always be the one to wave the white flag and say I'm sorry to somebody that never apologizes when they know that they're wrong. It's hard to take the high road when the high road can lead to bearing, being frustrated in your faith. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a place where you felt like you were doing your part in your walk and your relationship with Christ, but you felt like God really wasn't doing his part? Have you ever asked yourself, Lord, is it really worth it? I mean, God, is it really worth it? And when you start to think that way, the enemy will creep in and say, you know, you've got some other options at your disposal, don't you? I mean, you know some language that's not in the Bible. You know how to write a really good letter that could get some people in some, in some deep trouble. I mean, you know. The devil will come to you and say, hey, take your Christianity hat off for just a moment and let your flesh take care of this the way that you know you can take care of this. Has anybody ever been there? 
Can I tell you, I think the Lord brought me here to tell you what he tells me in those frustrating moments in my life. When I find my asking myself, is this really worth it? I hear the Holy Spirit tell me this. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. I know you know. Psalm 23, which says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I know you all know. Romans 8, 28, which says, God works for the good of those who love him. I know you know Isaiah 54, that no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. I know you know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. I know you know Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I know you know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. But can I tell you, my friend, one scripture you had better get embedded in your heart and in your soul is right here in Galatians 6, 9, which says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season you shall reap if you don't give up. This is the passage of scripture the Apostle Paul. He really wrote it to encourage us. Paul says, I know it's not always going to be easy. But commit yourself to doing the right thing. I know it's always going to be a fight to do what's right. But it's always worth it at the end of the day. I know, I know the devil. He's going to show you some other options that seem to be right there at your disposal that will, you think will take care of the situation better than, than the way the Lord will take care of it. But the Holy Spirit will say, stay on the high road. And do what God calls you to do. Let me give you a little background on this book of Galatians. Paul writes to this church at Galatia around 55 AD. That's, that's 55 years after the birth of Christ. And he says, and you must understand something about this letter. Paul's, Paul's upset, really. He's disappointed in this church. He's mad at this church. And He's angry with this church. You say, why is Paul mad? Why is he angry? Why is he disappointed in this church? Because you got to understand, Paul planted this church. And when he left, he left there with a bunch of Gentile Christians. That means these people weren't Jews. They were, they were, Gent they were like you and me. We're Gentiles. If you're not Jews, you're a Gentile. They, and they heard the gospel and they followed through. And man, they, they felt the Holy Spirit and great things happened. And then what happened is there were some people known as Judaizers come in. You say, what are Judaizers? Judaizers were Jewish people that had converted to Christianity, but they were a little bit off in their faith. Because what they did, they came in this church at Galatia and they came in and says, hey, that's great. You guys are Christians. But besides actually following Jesus, if you're a man, you need to be circumcised. Basically, what they were saying was, for you to really be a Christian, you need to be a Jew. And you need to, be a, a, and you need to follow the Jewish faith. That's, that's really where Christianity comes down to. And Paul hears what's happening. He's upset. And he writes, hey, church, I came and I preached Christ. And Christ alone. I didn't preach the law. I preached Christ. And you guys heard the gospel, the message of your salvation. You experienced the power of the Holy Spirit for yourself. And then these, this false doctrine came in. These Judaizers came in. They tell you something different and you guys fell for it. You guys just went along with it. And Paul's worried about this problem as he should be, but he not only has that problem, but as you read through the New Testament, you're gonna find out that Paul has a whole lot of other problems while this problem is going on. He has problems in the Corinthian church and his problem in the Philippian church and he has problems in the with other leaders that is if it's just one thing after another thing and Paul's just doing the best he can try to hold it all together and nobody's really appreciating what Paul is doing and, and I believe one of the reasons why Paul wrote this to the church was he's kind of writing it to himself and he's in effect saying hey don't grow weary Paul and well doing because if anything will make you weary, if anything will make you weak, it's people who don't appreciate you. It's people who take you for granted. It's people who don't reward your hard work. It's people that, that who you do good to, they turn around and do bad to you. It's, it's, it's something that will just, just take the wind out of your sails. It, it just takes your breath away. Can I ask y'all a question? Have you ever grown weary of well-doing. It's amazing to me that Paul recognizes that it's possible to grow weary doing well. You can grow weary 
doing well. It's amazing how quick we can get frustrated with, with doing what's right when there's no reward, but have you ever noticed that there are people who never get tired of doing wrong? There are some people that never seem to, seem to get tired of being mean and nasty and ugly. There's, it just seems to have no expiration date. I, I mean, you say, okay, prove it to me. i tell you how I can prove it to you. We all know people that just seem to be, from the time that you know them to this point today, they just seem to be mean and nasty and ugly, and they just don't seem to be getting any better. And they just, they just don't ever seem to get around it. I'm just like, man, how do you do all that? Can I ask you a question, my friend? How do you get tired of being well-doing, but you never get tired of being mean and nasty and ugly? So Paul says to himself, what he also says to us, don't get weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you don't quit. Paul's saying, don't quit doing what's right. Don't give up serving the Lord. Don't you let go of God's hand that is on you right now. Don't you throw in the towel. Don't you walk away from the calling that God has upon your life. Because in due season, you will reap if you don't quit. That word reap is an interesting word. Because most of the time when the word reap is used in the New Testament, it's always a reference to the, vin- to the final judgment seat of Christ. You will reap what you sow. Reap, in other words, is to remind you that your co-worker doesn't have the final say. Reap is to remind you that there is a God who sits on the throne in heaven and God is the final judge upon your life. It's God. I pray that there will be somebody here today, somebody this morning, that will embrace the word reap, that you will remember that there is a God up in heaven who sets a righteous, good, and holy God who sets up in heaven. And that God and that God alone is the judge of our lives. So here's Paul, and he uses this word reap. I believe that word reap has a lot of different meanings. And I just wanna give you a couple different things that I think God's trying to teach us in using the word reap. The first thing I believe God's trying to teach us is this. He's trying to tell us that we need to trust in God. Very simply, he's saying trust God. Reap is a reminder that God sees everything that is happening on this earth. Reap is a reminder. God knows it all. Nothing escapes the eyes of our God. Reap is a reminder that God is weighing out the reward. Reap is a reminder that your boss is not the giver of your reward, that no committee is the one that is the one that promotes you, but it is God who is the giver of your reward. It is God who is the one that brings about the harvest. Reap is a reminder that our God is not mocked. In fact, he starts out this passage of this part of this letter this way. He says, he says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. I think sometimes though, that we get this verse a little bit out of context because somebody would do something to us and that isn't nice. And we'll say, well, I'm not going to worry about it because you know what? God's going to get them back. What they did to me, God's going to get back a whole lot worse to them. And I understand where that kind of judgment, where that kind of statement comes from. And we'll in effect even speak damnation over that person's life. But can I ask you a question? What if that person repents? What if that person embraces 1 John 1, 9, which says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall also reap. It's not just a promise of damnation of over folks who've done wrong in our lives. That's not just what, can you, okay, you say, Travis, can, can you prove that to me? Here's, okay, let me ask you this. How many of you guys would say, you know what? I am so thankful that I have not reaped all the sin that I have sown in my life. I got both hands up and my foot. Because here's what I'll tell you, my friends. I am so glad, I'm so thankful, and I'm so grateful that my God is a gracious and merciful God, that I have not reaped all of the sin that I have sown in my life, but my God has forgiven me, that my God has saved me, and that my God has set me free. Is anybody here thankful that you have not reaped all of the sin that you have sown in your life? For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. And then he gives us that a little bit more detail. He says, for he who sows to the flesh 
will of the flesh reap corruption. So God's making it very clear. He's saying, I am a merciful, I am a loving, I am a grace-giving God. But make no mistake about it, I will not be mocked. And you, after time and time again, whenever I've given you chance after chance to repent, when you know you're doing wrong and you do wrong anyway, and you know you do wrong and you do wrong anyway, and you know you do wrong and you do wrong anyway, when you just continually just, just step on the grace and trample on the grace of our God, God's saying, don't be, you got to understand that the end result of that is essentially, it's going to be your spiritual and physical death. Because you are really reaping, you're going to reap destruction, you're going to reap, you're, you're going to reap catastrophic in result of all of that. And I'm so glad he doesn't end with that verse, with that proclamation of, de of damnation over that person's life. But then he also gives us a promise of reward because he also says this, he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit will reap everlasting life. So when you sow to the Spirit, it's you will, can I tell you all something, my friend? God knows your sacrifice. God knows the effort you're putting in. God knows how you have forgiven people who are hard to forgive. God saw you volunteer. God saw you do your best. God put, saw all that. God saw you take the high road when you could have gone low. And God is saying, you will be rewarded for your righteousness. You will be rewarded for your good deeds. Those, those good things do not go unnoticed. Don't get tired of well-doing. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Can I tell you, my friends, at the core of doing right and being committed to righteousness is for you to remember who are you being righteous for? Who are you doing it for? If you're just doing it, if I'm up here preaching, if the praise team's up here singing and playing, if they're just doing it for the applause of men, what happens when the applause stops? And if you're doing it just for that, then guess what? It will only be short-lived. And that's pretty much what Paul says about himself. In fact, every letter he writes in the New Testament to all the churches that he planted, this is what he says. He says, you guys got to understand, who am I doing this for? In fact, whenever he begins his letter to the church at Rome, he says in Romans 1.1, he says, I, Paul, I am a devoted slave of Jesus Christ on assignment authorized as an apostle to proclaim God's words and God's acts. Paul says, I'm on assignment by God himself. I am simply doing what God has called me to do. I'm not doing it for the apostles of men. I'm not doing it for Peter and the other disciples. I'm not doing it for the church of Corinthians. I'm not doing it for the Galatian church. I'm not doing it for the church of Philippi. I am doing this because God's called me to do it. And, he's, and he says, that this is my assignment on my life. Can I tell you, somebody called me last week and they said, man, how long are you going to continue to be a preacher, a pastor? And I've had other people ask me that at different times. And can I tell you why? One of the reasons, I guess why the main reason is I've never walked away from being a pastor. Why I've never just thrown in the towel whenever times got tough, whenever... There's issues and circumstances and things like that. And the reason why people would have, have, have even said lies about me, the reason why, you know, there's been times when people have cussed me out. And I wanted to cuss them back. I'm going to be honest with you, but I didn't. And I guess the reason why, I was thinking about this, why, why haven't I just stepped aside, just stepped down, and I think I just, I think back to that time when God called me to do this. God says, I have called you to open up the Bible and I've called you to preach the truth of God's word. And every time I get frustrated, every time I get irritated, every time I feel like I'm not qualified to even stand up here on this platform, guess what? I always think back to that moment and I remember, hey, I'm on assignment by God himself, just like Paul was. Can I tell you, you're on assignment by God himself. I don't, can I tell y'all something? Please get this. I love you. I love people. I do. I love old people. I love young people. I love babies. I love people in between babies and old people. And you define old people. I love, I love, I love all people. But can I tell y'all something? I don't do what I do for you. 
I do what I do because God called me to do this. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Nobody would. Nobody would do it. Anyway, for whatever man sows, that he will also re reap as a reminder that you can trust God. You can, you can trust him. But let me give you another reason. This is the last reason. And it's really reap reminds us where your reward comes from, where your harvest comes from, who's the provider of it all anyway. Can I tell you why so many people, I believe, get frustrated in life? It's because they're looking to the wrong source for their reward. Can I tell you why so many people get frustrated in life? They're looking to the wrong, can I tell you, they're looking to their coworker for validation. They're looking to their friends for affirmation. They're looking to their, their wife or their spouse to reward them. Can I just remind you of something, my friends? That God is your rewarder. That God is the one that provides the harvest. Let me say it like this. Stop looking for people to give you what can only come from God. Stop looking for people and that person and that person and that person for affirmation and for validation and for some kind of reward from them. When all of that will come from God, if you don't give up, guess what? God will affirm you. God will reward you. You'll look back on it, something that you did, and you'll just do it, and guess what? God will reward you. He will validate you. He will affirm what you're doing. God's the one that holds the harvest. He's the one that holds the reward. And then Paul says, let us not grow weary. Who's the us? You are the us. I'm the us. We are the us. And then he adds to the us by saying in verse 10, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everybody. By this, all men will know that you are truly my disciples if you love one another. People could give a rip how much you know until they know how much you care. You could have the Bible memorized backwards and frontwards and forwards and backwards. Guess what? They do not care until they know how much you do. And that's do good to all people. That's what's going to set you apart. And then he says, but you know what really separates you? But you do good, especially to those who are in the household of faith. I think one of the most overlooked words in this passage is the word us. Because Paul didn't say, let me not grow weary. Paul says, let us, let us. Paul understood something. Paul says, I can't do this on my own. It has to be. Us. If it's not us, it's not going to happen. Paul recognizes, guess what? I can only do so much by myself, but us together, we can really turn the world upside down for Jesus, man. And Paul is saying, hey, don't forget to encourage and pray for the people that are encouraging and praying for you. Another way to think about it is this way. Don't let the fact of what she said about you discourage you. Don't let the fact that maybe somebody didn't thank you for something that you did for them cause you to quit and give up on God. Can I tell you, you didn't do it for them anyway. You did it for the Lord. You did it for him. You, you did it because guess what? You were praising him. And I'm gonna tell y'all something. When we start judging our responses based on people's responses, to us, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know the kind of day that they dealt with. You don't know the news that they just had on the phone. You don't know what they're having to deal with in their own personal life. Everybody that you run into is facing some kind of tragic and horrible situation that you don't know anything about. So that's where we need to be very graceful in how we respond to people. Can I get an amen? amen. Paul's saying, hey, do good to all people. But man, especially do good to each other. Do good to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'll say this to you, friend. We're not a perfect church. I, I'm not a perfect pastor. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. She's got a list of my long. She'll tell you. But here's what she'll also tell you. She'll tell you, you know what, Travis? You're not perfect. I thank God I'm not, you're not who you used to be. Would anybody say, man, I thank God I'm not who I used to be. But God saved me, deliver me set me free. And I'll tell you something about this place. We've got some great us's in this place. We do. There are some us's 
that will encourage you. There are some us's that will pray for you and pray with you. There are some us's that go to this place that will help you in your time. There are some us's sitting in your aisle and sitting in your pew that would love to get you know you just to live. We got some great us's in this place. Can I tell you, I am thankful for this church and I'm thankful for you and I'm thankful that God has brought us together. So let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, can I tell you, due season is a time that's it's due. It, it, there comes a season where God's, of course, the the one that rewards, and God knows. Due season, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Don't give up. I know it's tough sometimes. I know we feel like we're swimming upstream sometimes. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. You love, you encourage, you pray. When God opens up the opportunity, you share the gospel. You share what God has done in your life. And you tell whoever will listen what God's done for me, he can do for you. And if you're here today and if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me tell you all something. What God's done in my life, he can do in your life. And you say, Travis, man, I'm too far gone. Let me tell you something. If you're still alive, breathing, got air in your lungs to breathe, you're not too far gone. In fact, I believe... That's why you're here. That's why you stumbled into this service right here and right now because God says, you know what? Today's your day. And the beautiful thing about salvation, the beautiful thing about, about coming to Christ, about admitting, admitting your need for him is that's really when your life takes off. I, I will be honest with you. I had a life before Christ, a BC life. And so my life is so much better it's so much better. There's so much more peace. I didn't say there wasn't chaos, but there's peace in the midst of it. And let me tell you, I didn't say there wasn't some pain. I didn't say there wasn't some heartbreak. I didn't say there wasn't. I'm just saying that, that God, God gets you through it. God grows you through it. And friend, if you're here today and if you don't know him, I pray that you won't leave here the same way you walk in here. Because there's not too many times in your life where you will get settled down enough for the Holy Spirit to speak to you. For God to get your attention and say, hey, today's the day and now's the time. Would you all pray with me? Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the truth of what Paul says right here that you inspired him to write it, God. And God, I pray for that person, that man or that woman, that teenager, that boy or that girl that maybe walked in here and they do... They don't know you as Lord and Savior. They, they don't know what that's like. My friend, the Bible says the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift that has to be received. There's nothing you can do to buy it or earn it or work for it. It is a precious gift from God. And when you receive it, you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what prompts you to live your life. The Holy Spirit prompts you to read the Bible. The Holy Spirit prompts you to pray. It's the Holy Spirit. But your first need is understanding, man, I need Jesus. So if you're here today and you say, you know what, Travis, man, I need to be saved. I need Christ in my life. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance and salvation. When you, The Bible says you call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved. It's between you and the Lord. You say it with your mouth and you mean it in your heart. The Bible says when you do that, you can be saved. So that's what God's pressing and nudging you to do. I invite you just to, maybe you drifted away from God. You say, you know what? I need to recommit my life to Christ. My friends, now's the time to do that. Just repeat this after me. Dear Lord, I repent of my sins. I ask you right here and right now to save my eternal soul, Lord. Do a new work in my life that only you can do. I'm, I'm not perfect, but God, I surrender all that I am to you. And it's in Jesus' name. I pray just with every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder how many of you, you prayed that prayer. You prayed as a first-time commitment or as a recommitment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. When I hit three, I want you to raise up your hand and say, Travis, pray for me. Because I prayed that prayer and I meant it when I prayed it. Don't let anything hold you back. When I hit three, raise up your hand. One, Jesus Christ loved you so much he died for you. Two, he was buried and rose again. Three, just raise up your hand all over the auditorium. 
Raise it up. God bless you guys in the back. Raise them up. Raise them. God bless you up here in the front. Amen. Amen. I see three, four hands go up. Amen. Keep them up real high. The Bible says you're ashamed of him. He's ashamed of you. If you confess him, he confesses you. I, let me tell you something, friend. There is no God like our God. And our God saw four hands go up this morning. I'm going to invite you to just stand up right now. Father, we love you. And God, we acknowledge, God, that sometimes it can be frustrating to walk this faith out. God, in fact, we can't walk it out without your spirit. So, Father, I pray that you would just fill us, overflow us with the, your power in your presence right here and right now, God. As Randy said earlier, let's speak the name of Jesus over our lives, over our families, over our, our businesses, over our church, over our friends, God. We speak the holy name of Jesus. And God, we also recognize that burdens and obstacles and decisions, Father, can weigh us down, wear us out, hold us up enemy will use whatever he can use just to trip us up and slow us down and keep us in bed keep us from the purpose that you have for us so God we just have this opportunity right now just to lay all that down just to turn it over to you just to lay every burden at your feet to recognizing God that, that you're the only one that can take care of it, you're the only one that can do it you're the only one that can change it so God we just open up this altar right now God, for you to have your way in every person's heart and every person's life. For that person that's facing a big decision this week. For the person that has relationship questions and issues and things like that that just seem to be causing so much havoc. God, whatever it might be. That person who's in trouble at work or got a, whatever it might be, Father, we just submit it all to your report. And we ask, Father, you just move in there just be a freedom, a release for us to respond to your voice. It's in Christ name I pray. Amen. Friend, if you're here today, if you got anything to pray about at all, I'll be up here. Brother Trent will be up here. Other people will be up here. We'd love to pray with you. Be honored to pray with you. If you just want to come and pray by yourself, come to this side of the altar and just come and pray. Either way, I invite you to just be obedient to the Holy Spirit and just come. Just come as the Holy Spirit leads you to come.